some of you are wondering about why I'm speaking so early. We are going to have a short video right after, uh, after my message, so uh, we wanted to move me forward, I guess. I don't know, but uh, I want to tell you a story, and uh, it's from a pastor, an author. Uh, his name is Max Licato, and he tells this great story, and he's, he tells a story of an older man that every Friday afternoon, he would go down to a pier. He lived in Florida on the beach, and he would go down to a pier, and he would have a bucket of shrimp in his hands. And as he would walk out, the shrimp wasn't for the fish, the shrimp wasn't for himself in any ways, but what he would do is he would slowly take those shrimp out and begin to throw them to the seagulls. And the seagulls would come by, you know, slowly, one at a time, and then soon, you know, as he was throwing this stuff out, there was just a flock of these seagulls all the way around him. And then when he was done, he would just go back to his house. And somebody looking at that and thinking, why does this old man come down here every Friday afternoon? Some people would look at that ritual and think, what a waste. You know, what a waste of time, what a waste of, you know, good shrimp to waste on these seagulls. But his rituals had a lot of meaning to it. And this man, his name was uh, Eddie Rickenbacker. And Eddie Rickenbacker was actually a captain in World War II in the Air Force, and he was a highly decorated, uh, uh, what, Air Force pilot. And uh, what, he, what happened when he was in the Air Force was uh, he and seven other guys got into a B-17 bomber, and they were flying to take a message to General Douglas MacArthur, and that was back you know, before there was navigation systems and planes and good ones anyways and, you know, communications. And so they were flying a message to General MacArthur and they got lost and their plane went down. And fortunately, miraculously, all of them survived and they found a life raft and they were in the life raft and they were, you know, being bombarded by all of the elements, whether it was rain or the intense sun. And soon they ran out of food. And it was, I think, eight days into it, they were out of food, out of water. And so Eddie Rickenbacker and others um, had a devotion. And after their devotion to the Lord, they prayed. They said, God, we need a miracle. And then they decided to all take a nap, a nap and rest. And Eddie Rickenbacker, he had a, a hat on. And as he was resting... A seagull landed on his head and he thought if I can capture this thing it's gonna save us and so he did catch that seagull they killed it they ate it they took the entrails the guts of the thing and used it to fish and they were able to survive another I don't know 24 days because of this miracle that happened and so Eddie Rickenbacker every Friday afternoon had this ritual where he would take that bucket of shrimp and go feed the seagulls and he said God thank you so much for that miracle that you provided so that we could live and so it wasn't it wasn't an empty ritual sometimes we look at rituals sometimes we look at things that we do and we think man they're empty but as we look deep into the person's heart there is actual meaning behind the rituals and the things that they do. And the same is true as we study the book of Leviticus. I know some of you weren't here last week and we just began a study and we began to look into this book of Leviticus and it's a complicated book. It's real complex. There's a lot of weird things in this book of Leviticus but hopefully over the next couple weeks we're going to kind of peel back some of those layers and really figure out, you know, why did God write this? Because some people would say that the book of Leviticus, even though it's very difficult to read, difficult to understand for us, they say it's one of the most important, if not the most important book in the Old Testament. And some would say it's not only the most important book in the Old Testament, but it is for the whole Old and New Testament because it really lays out for us, it gives us a foundation for the whole meaning of salvation. 
and the gospel message. And so we're going to dig into this, and as we talked about last week a little bit, is that it's, it's really a continuation of the Old Testament books that are before it. See, Leviticus is the third book of the Bible, and it's really just a continuation of the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus. And so as we talked about last week, Genesis starts off in a great place. God created a perfect environment for Adam and Eve to be in. He had a perfect relationship with them. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He was present with them in this incredible environment. But as you know, in Genesis chapter 3, something happened. Man chooses to do his own thing. He thinks, I know better than God. I know the best pathway. I know things more than God, and I'm going to choose my own way, and I'm going to ignore God's way. I'm going to do my own thing because I think I know better than God. We do the same thing today, don't we? And so what happened as a result of what we call the fall, death entered the world. We became twisted. We became, you know, emotionally we were broken people. We were diseased people. The earth is, is in, a, in a mess as well. Everything was touched by the fall. And so we move ahead into, into the book of Exodus, and we see that, you know, man is in captivity. He is in captivity, you know, in, in Egypt. God, through a bunch of miracles and plagues, he frees man, walked through the Red Sea, and God is in the process of recreating his nation, recreating his people. And God has given his people a covenant to follow, and he says, now you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant. You'll be my own possession out of all the people's. Although the whole earth is mine, and you'll be my kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And what he's saying there is that I'm going to be your God. I'm going to abundantly bless you. I'm going to abundantly give you things and, and give you an abundant life if you follow. And so that was their choice. And so through a series of things in Exodus, we see how that plays out. And, and then God says, I am going to live with you again. Just like it was in the Garden of Eden, I'm going to live with you again, and I'm going to live with you in a place called the tabernacle. And so he talks to Moses and tells Moses how to build this tabernacle, and another name for it is this tent of meeting. And he says, I'm going to live in this tent of meeting. I'm going to live amongst you. I'm going to live in your presence. I'm going to be there with you, and you will be my people, and we'll have a a relationship together. And there's a, there's a lot to that, but uh, he says, I'm going to live in this holy place called the Holy of Holies. And then as we saw, we move on to the end of Exodus, and we see him, we see God talking to Moses from the tabernacle. He says this, the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Okay, so this huge cloud. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Incredible thing. You know, and, and God is there. But here's the key point. Moses was unable to enter. He was unable to enter the tabernacle. <laughs> I'm trying to figure, that's not Dave's fault, so don't look at Dave. Moses was not unable to enter the tabernacle. So the tent of meeting, because the cloud rested on it. So here it is, here it is. God is present. God has just told Moses and all this elaborate system, build this tabernacle because I'm going to be here. And then here we are at the end of Exodus, and there's this tension point. Moses, the most holy person alive, can't enter into the tabernacle, can't enter into the presence of God. And that's where Exodus ends. Leviticus begins, and uh, let me... I guess before we enter into Leviticus, let me just give you a little bit of a sidebar here. One of the things, one of the observations here of, of Exodus and this, this point at the very end of this is, is this, and you could write this in. One of the key points of the gospel is this, is that God invites us to meet with him. Even though we are sinful people, even though we do our own thing, even though we want to go our own way, even want...
don't. Still on. All right. I'll go with this. Where was I? Even though, you know, even though, uh, here we go. Awesome. <laughs> I'm laughing at Dave. Sorry, Dave. Uh, did I just go out again? It is a test. There it is. I'm not going to move. God invites us into his presence. Even though we are a sinful people, again, even though we've thumbed our nose at God, the great part about the gospel, and we see it throughout all of all the scriptures, from the very beginning uh, in the garden to the very end when we can spend eternity with God, this, the message that God is saying to us is that he wants us to be in his presence. He wants us to be there with him. I mean, we, we see that in stories, you know, in the New Testament, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep. We see in Luke 19 where Jesus uh, says this, you know, this is his purpose in coming, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. There we go. I didn't, I didn't move. <laughs> Christ has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, the question then, you know, that as we finish up in Exodus here, is not where is God going to live? God has said, I'm going to live in the tabernacle. I'm going to live in your presence there. And so the question as we enter into Leviticus really is this, is how can we, a sinful people, join God and live in his presence? And so as you look at the book of Leviticus, the, the key point here, or the key theme here of Leviticus really is this. It's about how sinful people of the Old Testament can dwell in the presence of a holy God. How can we as, as a sinful people reside with God? Because God is perfect. He is holy in every way. And he can't allow people who are not holy to be in his presence. And so the question that we have as we move into this Leviticus is, how can we do that? How can they do that? And the answer is, it's the offerings. It's through these sacrifices that man and women, men and women can enter into his presence. Our sin requires an atonement. Because we're sinful, there needs to be this atonement. And so this atonement means, you know, at one. And so here you have a holy God and a, and a sinful man, and how can these two be reconciled with one another? How can they join into a relationship with one another? And so it's through this atonement. And to, atonement means, it means wiping clean. And it means to, you know, even though we are sinful people, this atonement wipes the slate clean. Or another way to think about it is paying a ransom price for the person. And so this atonement must happen. It mu uh, we need to shut that off. And so that's where we get into Leviticus chapter 1. And in chapter 1, he talks about the burnt offering. In the first couple chapters of Leviticus, he's really talking about five different offerings. But in the first one, the first chapter, he talks about this burnt offering offering and it's and this atonement here is this central you know it's the central theme of this first part of Leviticus and so the point is is that he's, that's being said here in this in Leviticus is that death must happen death is what pays this atonement penalty the substitutionary death of an animal temporarily satisfies this wrath of God it temporarily does that. And so an animal is paying this ransom price for the people. So let's look at this passage. 
If his offering is a burnt offering, it starts out from the herd, meaning cattle, meaning bulls. He's to bring an unblemished male. He'll bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering so it can be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He's to slaughter the bull before the Lord. Aaron's sons, the priests, are to present the blood and splatter it on all sides of the altar that is at the entrance to, to the tent of meeting. Then he is to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, will prepare a fire on the altar and arrange the wood on the fire. Aaron's sons, the priests, are to arrange the pieces, the head and the fat, on top of the burning wood of the altar. And the offerer is to wash the entrails and the legs with water. Then the priests will burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a fire offering of, ple of pleasing Roma to the Lord. And so the first thing that I get out of this, and you could write this in, is that worship, on behalf of the worshiper, worship requires our best. As the worshiper comes to the Lord, he is required to bring his best. And that word burnt offering, it's, that, it's a Hebrew word, it's ola, which means to arise. And the whole thought is, is that this smoke that arises from this burnt offering is a pleasing aroma to God. And as, as the, the worshiper brings that, it, it, it's, and it's burned up, it pleases the Lord. Now, if you were to read further in Leviticus, and if you're doing that on your own, which I would encourage, you know, you're going to see that there's three different types of offerings. There, you could offer a bull, you could offer a lamb, you could offer a bird. And it depended on your, your uh, financial means. If you were wealthy, you know, you brought a bull. If you're One of the things, the essential ingredient in these offerings was this, is that it had to be costly. It had to be costly. Um, imagine, imagine this. There it is again. A person would be raising their bull for a year. They'd be feeding that bull. They'd be taking care of that bull. They would be knowing that this was the bull that was going to be used for the sacrifice. And then one day, you know, they bring it to the person there, to, to who he was, you know, to the priest. And the thing is, is that I think what was happening was they weren't going to use an old bull. They weren't going to be using a bull that was tired and, and done with their production, you know, but they were using a bull that, right, was coming to that point of being a productive animal and getting some payback and then they were going to take that to be slaughtered. So worship is costly. It, you know, God wants our best. You know, as we come to worship, God wants our best. He doesn't want something that was, you know, that wasn't useful to us. So he wants our best. And these people, meat was a luxury for them. And, you know, cattle or, or lambs were, were a luxury. And, you know, to give something of value was something that was required of them. So let's go and look at, you know, how this was done. It describes a little bit of how it was done. So the person would actually bring the bull to the temple, to the tabernacle. And you can imagine. I mean, you've just raised this bull or lamb for the last year. And here you are, you're walking this long walk from the pasture, and you're bringing this to the tabernacle, knowing that this animal was about to be sacrificed. And so he brings it to the entrance, and the priest checks this out to see, is this, you know, is this unblemished or not? 
And so he brings it there, and uh, he presents it to the priest. The priest inspects it. And then look what happens. He lays his hand on the head of the burnt offering. Can you imagine? I mean, in the, the point of this, the, the, the wording there of to lay his hand is to press in on it, to lean in on it. And the whole point is as the person, the worshiper, was coming and pressing his hand on the head of the bull or the lamb, there was a sense of he was symbolically transferring the sin of his life, of his family, onto the animal. And at that point, maybe he, he said a prayer. And maybe he confessed his sin. Maybe he admitted to his sin. And as he did that, he killed the animal. And he had to do it in the right way because the priest then would grab a basin and collect the blood that was dripped out. The priest didn't want to get dirty, but it was, it was all on the, the hands of the worshiper. And so he would slaughter this animal he would slaughter this bull and press his sin in on that. And again, he is to slaughter this. And so the worshiper is really involved in this whole process. He is the one that is cutting up the animal. He is the one that is, that is you know, washing the entrails of this animal. He is the one that is participating in the whole service. And it's a lot different than, you know, than our service today, isn't it? I mean, and so, you know, you would have Aaron's sons, you know, presenting this blood, and they were to splatter it on the altar at the, at the entrance of the tent. And then the skin, everything but the skin is burnt. The skin the priest could keep for a salary or something like that. He could sell it or whatever. But this burnt offering is offered up to, to the Lord. And so, again, I say it's a lot different than our service, isn't it? I mean, you know, we come in, and I'm half joking here, but I mean, we come in, you know, we drive our cars in, we park it in the lot, you know, we come in through the door, we say hi to a couple people, we may sing some songs, you know, we may hear a sermon, we may sing a couple more songs, and then we head home, we go to eat dinner or whatever, we have our cup of coffee, and, you know, our worship service is a lot different. In those days, I mean, they realized I mean, that, man, their sin is being transferred to this innocent animal. And because sin needed to be atoned for. Which leads to that next question. Why did the sacrificial system involve death? I mean, why did God do it this way? He could have done it different ways, but why does it involve death? And, you know, one of the greatest problems, I think, as we read some of this stuff is really why is there so much blood? Why, why are we sacrificing innocent animals in this whole thing? And that's a hard thing. I mean, it seems so cruel. But through this, I think, I think we see that sin is very serious. And sacrifice is at the heart of the Christian message. A lot of times we think, you know, Christianity is about some nice sayings. Or that Christianity is about following certain rules. Or Christianity is about doing good things or, you know, you know helping people out or whatever it might be. But the, at the heart of Christianity is sacrifice. Sacrifice is all the way through the scriptures. And if we miss that point, we miss the heart of Christianity. Back in the garden, God said, don't eat from the tree. Again, it was a warning. They were supposed to obey, he, and, he, and he gave a, a stipulation, a curse from it. He said, on the day you eat from it, you're going to certainly die. And so he's connecting death. If they are to sin, if they are to disobey, death is connected to it. Skipping ahead into Romans chapter 6, it says, the wages of our sin is death. The consequences, what we deserve because of sin is death. It's that serious. And so Leviticus takes it really serious. And so every morning, they were supposed to worship by sacrificing an animal. Every evening, they were to worship by sacrificing an animal. So every morning and every evening, an animal was sacrificed. And the continual aroma of a burnt sacrifice was lifted up to God. And what this said was, you know, 
Again, through this innocent animal, your sins will be atoned for. Your sins will be placed on, on an animal that is innocent because humans are more important than these animals and the cost of sin is really high. All right, so what's the purpose of the burnt offering? Again, as you go through, as we'll talk about in the weeks coming, you know, the burnt offering is the first one that's, that's mentioned. There's other offerings. There's five offerings. There's the grain offering. There's the fellowship offering. There's the sin offering. There's the guilt offering. This particular one of the burnt offering is basically, it's a general offering. It's saying, God, I have nothing to offer. God, I am... I am immoral in my being. I don't have anything good in me to offer. And I am submitting to you. I am offering this up because I am a depraved person. I have sinned in through and through. And I'm offering up this animal because I don't have anything to offer. And so this burnt offering is just basically saying, God, I'm surrendering myself to you. I'm surrendering everything that I have. I'm putting everything on the altar, and it's a symbol of that. And so, when we worship, just like they had to and what we have to do as we come to church, when we worship, our heart needs to be right. Our heart needs to be in the right place. And again, you can do these rituals, you can go through these things, we can, we can today, you know, think, you know, check, I did that, check, I went to church, check, I had, you know, prayed, check, I read my Bible, check, I did these things, and we can think, oh, we must be good. The same thing is true when, when these people offered up sacrifices, God doesn't delight necessarily in the sacrifice, but what he delights in is, is our heart. In Psalm 40, it says, you do not delight in a sacrifice, in an offering, you, you do not ask for a whole burnt offering. And he says, I delight to do your will. And so the psalmist here is saying, I delight in that. My heart is towards the light. I, I am I'm coming with a good heart. Look what it says here further. When we come to the Lord, when we come with sacrifice, we need to have a heart of obedience. God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to walk in your way. I want, when you say to do something, I want to do that. I, I'm coming with an attitude of trust. I'm trusting that you are going to fulfill your promise. These people were trusting that God was going to provide a sacrifice for them. We're the same way. We're going to put our trust that Christ is our sacrifice. And then thirdly, we need to come with an attitude, a heart of repentance. A heart that is right with the Lord. David said this in Psalm 51. It reflects his heart. It says, You do not want a sacrifice for the sake of a sacrifice, or I'd give it. And you're not pleased with simply just a burnt offering, right? A sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. It's coming to him with a repentant spirit. You'll, you will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. And then in the book of Micah, and if you've read the book of Micah, we've talked about it in the past, it's kind of like a, a court of law. And these people are, are being very sarcastic with God as they answer back to him. So you can kind of catch the sarcasm here. It says, they're saying, what should I bring before the Lord when I come and bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings or year-old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with 10,000 rams or 10,000 streams of oil? You know, should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? And they're really being sarcastic here. But Micah comes back and says, hey, he's told you. What, what, what is required, what's good and what, what the Lord requires of you to act justly to love faithfulness and to walk humbly with God and the same is true today God wants us he doesn't want us to, just to show up but he wants us to come with a broken heart, he wants us to come with a repentant heart he wants us to offer our, our ourselves with a humble attitude. Why don't we question it? People ask today, I guess, and I've 
answered for, but uh, why don't we still sacrifice animals today? Why don't we still do what Leviticus says? You know, are we supposed to? It's in the Bible. Are we supposed to continue to do this? Well, let me just say this. Leviticus is not a finished system. Leviticus just kind of shows us, it points us to what's going to happen into the future uh, at a distant point. And so it points us to what God is going to do in the person of Christ. And so it, Leviticus, Leviticus kind of puts into motion what's going to happen. And so as we read it, we are thinking it's a piece of the puzzle. It's a first step in the puzzle of the way God is going to fulfill it and the way God is going to fill, fulfill the Old Testament in the person of Christ. Jesus is the one that came to fulfill all of the Old Testament promises. And, he, and, and what Jesus does is he cancels the stuff that went on before in the Old Testament and he fulfills those things in the New. Look what he says in Hebrews. He being Jesus, cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. And so, again, Christ has fulfilled it. He has fully fulfilled it. And Leviticus is a picture of what's happening and what is going to happen in the person of of Christ. And so, how does the burnt offering point to Christ? God doesn't change. He is still holy. He is still pure. He still wants us to be in his presence. He still invites us into his presence. The problem we still have, as it says in Romans 3, we all are still sinful people. We have got to figure out how can a sinful person like myself enter into the presence of God. We still have to deal with that sin, and it still says the wages of our sin or the consequences of our sin is still death. And so we still today need to have an atonement for the penalty of our sin, for the depth of our sin. We need that atonement. And we don't do it through sheep. We don't do it through bulls. We don't do it through, you know, birds. But we do it through the person of Christ. And Romans 6.23 finishes up. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gift. That's the atonement. We have that sin problem, but Christ is our gift. And so, Jesus says in Hebrews 9, or it says about Jesus, it says, But now, once, for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Christ is our atonement. He has done that for us. So God wants us to be in his presence. We have a problem with this sin, but God provides that solution by giving us his son, and that son is Christ. And he has provided for us so that we can have this atonement. And if you are a believer in Christ, if you place your faith in Christ, this is true of you. We have been sanctified. We have been made holy. We have been made pure. We have been right, made righteous. We have been set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ for all time. He's given that gift to us. He has made that atonement. And it says of him as well, he did not even spare his own son, but offered him up. He was that burnt offering for us, for us all, so that we could enjoy the presence of God. Now, I go back to that question. You know, for all of us in here, We've got to figure out how can we, as a sinful person, enjoy the presence of God? How can we, as a sinful person, enter into heaven with God? We cannot get into heaven unless we have had our sins paid for, unless our sins are atoned for, unless we have placed our faith in the provision that Christ has given to us. We have got to do that. And I know for some of us in here, 
we're, 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 we have not placed our faith in Christ. But you need to do that. What I want to do right now, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to come up or anything like that, but I'm going to ask you, everyone, just to bow your head. And if you're one of those people who has not placed your faith in the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I want you to just in your heart, quietly, you don't have to stand up or speak up or anything like that, but just in your heart, pray a prayer with me and place your faith in Christ so that you can be in the presence of God. You could pray a prayer something like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and being my substitute. I admit that I've sinned and I need your forgiveness and cleansing. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be my sacrifice, to pay the ransom for my sin. I place my trust in you now. Amen. You can look up. That's fine. If you have done something like that, you know, maybe John 3.16 says, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, everyone who believes in him, will have eternal life. If you have placed your trust in Christ, if you have invited Christ to pay the penalty for your sin, you can have eternal life with him. Now, I know for some of us, you know, many of us in here, we have already placed our faith in Christ. And you might be asking, what does the burnt offering say to me? How do I apply that today? And I think a way to apply it for some of us that have placed our faith in Christ is really, it, you know, I, I think of the, the burnt offering is, has been given, it, it's something that was given every morning and every evening. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an offering of submission. And I think for us, it, it, I guess, symbolizes our desire to give up of ourselves, to sacrifice ourselves. Romans 12, 1, and 1 says it really well. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God and what he's done for you, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And just as these people offered up their, their, their offerings, their burnt offerings, morning and evening, I think that's what God calls us to as believers, to offer ourselves as a living and holy sacrifice to the Lord. And I think he's saying, you know, this is, this is what worship is. And so I think it's us just saying to God, God, I submit myself to you. Today I don't have anything to offer except for myself and I'm giving it to you. I am getting on that altar as a living sacrifice. I am yours. Do what you want with me. I think that's what the burnt offering is for us. Hey, let's just, here's what I'm gonna do right now. I just wanna pray for us, and then what I wanna do is, I'm gonna show a, a short video. That's maybe not too short. It is about eight minutes. Um, but it really summarizes the book of Leviticus and this whole process of the offerings. And then we're going to sing a song after that. So let me just pray for us as we close.